Have you ever been in a math class, listening to a lecture, and you find yourself thinking, oh my god, who the hell cares? I think even math students can occasionally admit to this. Math education is notoriously hard to connect with. I would like to offer how I think I personally was able to overcome these who the hell cares moments and enjoy math much more than I did before. I suggest that before you take a math class, you should have a problem you would like to solve in your head. The problem doesn't have to be within the subject in question, nor does it need to be unsolved by the greater mathematics community. All you will need is to truly care about it. The problem can be about baseball statistics, Minecraft crop growth, or YouTube analytics. Use whatever you find interesting to motivate your own studies. Say you're about to learn real analysis. I suggest then that you should have, say, a function you want to learn more about. Suddenly, every theorem you read that starts take a function f defined on r yada 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 turns into take your function f defined on r yada yada yada. That function you care about will bring extra context to what you are learning. Whether or not the theorem actually helps solve your problem is unimportant. It's the recontextualization of the material that is so critical. I call these backburner problems because, well, you keep them on the backburner. As an undergraduate, I had a couple backburner problems that kept me motivated and curious throughout my coursework. I'd like to show you one I made up myself, the progress I made on it, and some lessons I picked up along the way. About five years ago, while I was on a long flight home, I sketched out the following problem. Imagine you have six types of squares, and on each square is a red line. You then put the squares in a rectangular grid, like you're tiling a bathroom floor. You can use as many of each square, or tile, as you'd like. Here's an example tiling of a 7x5 grid. Here is another example. As you can see, this process gives these nice strange little designs. I started calling these things mosaics on that flight, so that's what we'll call them now. Let's look at another one. Do you see that? This time we got a special region in our mosaic. The red lines have drawn out a connected shape. Let's see another mosaic with one of these shapes. As you can see, these shapes can get pretty complicated. The question that I asked was, what is the probability that when you make an n by m mosaic, you get at least one connected shape? So I got to work. The first thing you will want to do when working on a new math problem is to define some notation. This will help you formalize your ideas. Let's have p and m be the probability that we get at least one connected shape in an n by m mosaic. So p and m is then the number of mosaics with connected shapes over the total number of mosaics. We'll call the numerator t n m. We can then write that 6 to the n times m is the denominator. Why this value? We have n times m spots to put tiles, and six choices, one for each tile type. So we can write the denominator easily, so we will just focus on t and m for the rest of this video. Now that we have notation to find, the next step you will likely want to do is collect some empirical data. This means get a feel for your problem. Sketch out some cases, find some examples or counterexamples, and begin to form a hypothesis. For us, this means finding some small values of t and m. Let's start with t11. We have six mosaics to go through, none of which form a connected shape. This means that t11 is 0. In fact, if either n or m is 1, no matter how hard we try, we can't make any connected shapes, so all of those values are 0. Next, let's look at t22. Here, we can make just one connected shape, this little diamond shape here. So t22 is 1. How about T23? This one is a little more complicated, but let's give it a shot. First, we can make this long diamond shape here. There's just one of those. Next, we can see the smaller diamond appear in the top four spaces. See how we have two open spaces below? Since we only care about making at least one connected region, and we already have one above, these tiles can be anything. Since we have six choices for each open space, there are six squared mosaics with this connected region here. Similarly, for when the smaller diamond appears in the bottom four spaces, 
we have two open spaces above, and so we also have 6 squared for this case. So T23 is 1 plus 6 squared plus 6 squared, which is 73. For the rest of this video, let's call an open space that can be any tile an open and mark them with a dot. This way, it is clear that the space is accounted for, it can just be anything. I'd like to take you through one more case to illustrate the last concept for counting these shapes. Let's compute T24. Going a bit quicker, we have these seven cases, and if we mark the opens, multiply each case by 6 to the number of opens, and add them all up, we'll get our answer, right? Unfortunately not. Can you see where we went wrong? Look at these three cases. Because opens can be anything, this group of four opens could include the diamond shape. Same with this case, the opens could contain the small diamond. So, instead of counting the two diamond case on the right separately, we've actually already counted it. In fact, we have counted it twice. This means that instead of adding one for this last case, we should actually subtract one, which means T24 is 3960. This phenomena is known as the inclusion-exclusion principle. It may be hard for a student to pick up on the ramifications of such an idea when this line of math is slapped up on a lecture slide. Instead, notice how we naturally arrive at the idea ourselves simply by noticing that we are overcounting some of our cases and determining how much we need to subtract to get a correct answer. Reaching the principle this way often gives a better understanding of the general rule. Another important technique is summarizing your findings. Let's put what we have found so far in a little array. We already determined that anything with a 1 gives 0, 2, 2 is 1, 2, 3 is 73, and 2, 4 is 3960. Also, because the number of mosaics with a connected region in an n by m rectangle is the same for an m by n rectangle, we know all of these values as well. The last data point I calculated before the plane landed was T33. There's no complicated double counting, so I will leave it up to the viewer to compute that T33 is 31,998. Here's a quick look at this array, but for PN. We do that just by dividing these values by 6 to the n times m, like we saw before. These arrays are as far as I got on that flight. After I landed, the problem really stuck with me. It became my first backburner problem, and so I carried it through my coursework hoping that one of the lectures I attended would give me the tools I needed to get further. I first took a course in probability, which formally taught me the inclusion-exclusion principle. I was taught how to understand what this notation actually said, and how to use it in my own problems. I was already familiar with the idea from our work before, and so I found myself understanding it quite well. The benefits of a backburner problem were already appearing. Other than that, though, the course didn't get me further. However, another course I took that semester did. The first course that helped me was an Introduction to Programming course. Before, filling out the last entries in that array seemed out of my reach. They were just too complicated. But now that I was taking this course, each programming technique I learned became a new way to get the next value. After completing the course, I wrote an algorithm to compute values of T and M that allowed me to complete my initial array. But even the algorithm could only produce a few more values before it became too slow. What else could I do? Well, I decided that enumerating the general T and M may be too tricky to take on directly, so why not just focus on solving a single row? I set my sights on enumerating the N by 2 case. But how would I do that? I would need to take another course to find out. The course that really opened this problem up to me was combinatorics. Solving the n by 2 case still seemed difficult at the time, until I learned about linear recurrence relations. A linear recurrence relation is an equation that defines a function f of some variable, let's say k, in terms of its previous values. Here's an example of one. These types of relationships were a large topic in this course. Again, the lessons that would have been mundane became critical once I realized I could write my own linear recurrence for the n by 2 case. Let's see how to do that. Earlier, we calculated t22, t32, and t42 manually. Let's see if we can compute t52 using what we know. 
Let's take our collection of mosaics counted in T42 and add two cells to the right. For every mosaic we counted in T42, we can have any combination of tiles for these two new cells and still have it contain at least one connected shape. So T52 is at least 6 squared times T42. Are there any more mosaics in T52? Yes, there are. The previous method computed all mosaics in T52 where there was at least one connected shape that was within the left eight cells. So we need to count the number of mosaics that have a connected shape that uses the two new cells and have that be the only connected shape in the mosaic. To count these mosaics, we can make that connected shape and then compute the number of mosaics in the remaining space that don't have any connected shapes. Let's make the smallest connected shape, the small diamond, first. This leaves us with a 3 by 2 region. We know the number of mosaics that do have at least one connected region to be T32, and so the number of mosaics that don't have any is 6 to the 3 times 2 minus T32. Doing this for each possible width of connected shape, that being widths 2, 3, 4, and 5, gives us the total for all of these types of mosaics, and consequently, all mosaics in a 5 by 2 grid. And so T52 equals the sum, which equals 190,475. We can generalize this process we just did into this recurrence relation. This equation is certainly useful for programming, but how do we use it to get a formula for Tn2? Well, this same course taught me how we can use a tool called a generating function to solve this exactly. Don't worry if you don't know what a generating function is. They can really just be seen as a step between the recurrence relation and the actual solution. The important thing for this video is that generating functions are confusing. You learn about power series and calculus and all you ever worry about is convergence. You only ever talk about a series in terms of its input and all you care about is the value of the sum. Then you learn generating functions and they look exactly the same as power series, except you don't care about convergence, you don't care about its input, and you don't care about the value of the sum. You only care about the coefficients. This was a massive mental shift for me, and so I really struggled through this unit. I think the reason for the hardship was how similar they looked to something I did know. It wasn't something new and completely different looking, it was something new and so familiar that the familiarity interfered with the new. With how much I struggled, I certainly would have mm hmmed my way through the unit. However, I had a linear recurrence of my own that I needed to solve. So I put in the extra time. I read and reread the textbook and did some extra problems until I understood. I really am happy this problem was with me, because generating functions are powerful tools to have in your arsenal. And with them, I was able to get an exact expression for Tn2. Here it is. In this formula, alpha is 1 half plus 1 half times the square root of 33 over 37, and similarly beta is 1 half minus 1 half times the square root of 33 over 37. This is an exact expression for the second row of the array we saw earlier, and is valid for n greater than or equal to 2. And, like we mentioned before, dividing by 6 to the 2 times n on both sides gives an exact expression for the probability of an n by 2 mosaic containing a connected shape. We can see that as n increases, the probability there is at least one connected shape increases slowly. It is a good exercise for the viewer to show this probability goes to 1 as n goes to infinity. Also, just for fun, the smallest width n, such that there is a greater than 50% chance of getting a connected shape, is 874. So you need a 2 by 874 rectangle to see at least one of these shapes a majority of the time. What else can we do? It turns out that we can solve the third row of our array as well. Tn3 follows a more complicated recurrence, but you can solve it to give this ridiculous equation. In an amusing twist of fate, in combinatorics, it's often more common to just give the generating function instead of the exact formula, because of how unwieldy the exact formula can get. This is the generating function for Tn3 for all that are curious. What about more rows? Well, solving Tn4 and beyond seems out of my reach. Rows larger than 3 are just too complicated. 
This is a common fate of a back burner problem. Sometimes you can't answer everything you hoped to answer, and that's okay. A back burner problem's purpose isn't solely to be solved, but instead to motivate and inspire. One of the reasons I made this video was to see if anyone wanted to give it a go on their own, to make the mosaic problem their own back burner problem. It was so useful for me that I thought I would share it with the larger math world, in the hopes that someone else can find some use in it too. Speaking of which, with any good problem, you will find many extra problems that you find along the way. Knowing which of these paths to go down and which to leave alone is a crucial step for your productivity. Here is a problem I asked about mosaics that I decided to leave alone that I thought you may enjoy. We saw previously that the probability that one gets at least one connected shape goes to one as the size of the grid you are tiling increases. This means that on the infinite square grid, you will get at least one shape with probability one. What else could you ask on the infinite grid? Well, you could ask what is the probability that a specific cell is part of the shape's perimeter? For example, this cell is part of a perimeter, but this one is not. An expression for this probability can be written as follows. If we let an be the number of shapes you can draw of length 2n, then the probability that a cell in the infinite grid is part of a shape's perimeter is this sum, which is about 3 in 1,000. So about 3 out of every 1,000 cells are part of a connected shape on the infinite grid. I introduce this because there is a similar sounding problem which seems to be much harder. What if, instead of wanting to know the probability that a cell is part of a perimeter, you want to know the probability a cell is enclosed by a shape? This is more difficult because on larger grids, shapes can enclose other smaller shapes. For example, this cell is enclosed by two shapes. If we assert that a cell is only counted as being enclosed if it is surrounded by an odd number of shapes, what is the chance that it is enclosed on the infinite grid? Pretty interesting question, huh? This video was all about why you should have a back burner problem. They really are just so useful for learning mathematics. If you're interested in making the mosaic problem your own back burner problem, here is a brief list of suggested reading that I have compiled. Here are my sources. And here are my favorite comments from my previous videos. I would also like to offer my sincerest thanks to my girlfriend Kimberly, who provided the hand-drawn animations for this video. Thanks for being the best, Honeybun. Finally, I would like to thank you all for watching. Have a nice day.